drinking your 32 ounce mega big gulp. <laughs> this is my water, watch it. <laughs> All right, everyone. I am so excited to introduce today's guest to you. He is Mark Bittman. I'm sure you have heard of him, if not for this wonderful book that is a Bible in my kitchen, How to Cook Everything, his latest book, How to Eat. You've probably seen him. He's been for 30 years. He had been a columnist, an opinion com columnist for the New York Times and the lead magazine food writer for New York Times Magazine. You've also seen him on television. So today's show, Chopped. All things considered, Showtime's years of living dangerously. I'm so excited to have him here. He is a good friend. Uh, we have a good friend in common, Dr. David Katz, his co-author on this book. We pulled some strings because you will see that Mark Bittman's Instagram account is drool worthy, and I had to get him on the show. So welcome, Mark. Well, thank you. Nice to be here. Thank you. You've taken, as I said, you've had a venerable place in my kitchen for years. And so now I'm glad to have you here in person. So I pitched to New York Magazine something like the last conversation you'll ever need to mm -hmm. have about food and diet. People want to know, is coffee good for me? Should I be eating right. yogurt instead of drinking milk? Should, is chicken okay? You know, everybody yeah. wants those kind of details. So the generalizations about eat more plants, eat less junk food. Right. People know that, but they want the like, you know, is green tea good? You know, they that. want the specifics. They want the, in, in execution, tell me actually what to do. I think we have to understand that eating is really an agricultural act. We eat the food that's out there. So if you want to change your diet, you have to start with what's being planted. You have to it's, it, if we are going to plant 40% of the agricultural acreage in the United States in corn, we are going to be eating a lot of corn products. Yes. And that means we're going to be eating a lot of ultra-processed food, and we're going to be eating a lot of industrially produced animals. Mm -hmm. So if we encourage big farms to grow corn and other kind of monocrops like uh, soybeans and wheat and so on, if that's the kind of farming that we support, we are going to have um, less than ideal diets. Mm -hmm. We're going to have environmental damage. We're going to have declining production because soil is being uh, used at a, at a unreplenishable rate. And we're gonna have a huge carbon footprint. So all of those things come from agriculture mm -hmm. as, does, as do many of our public health problems. So, so are you saying that we eat badly because that's what's grown or are the farmers not, do their farmers are growing that because that's what we're demanding? No, I don't think it is what we're demanding. I think that, you know, that's like saying, well, our taste buds demand cocoa puffs. Before cocoa puffs <laughs> existed, our taste buds were just fine. So we will eat, we will ad adapt to eat mm -hmm. the food that is in front of us. And if the food that's in front of us is good and well raised and so on then that's what we'll eat we learn our habits young and we learn some of them from our parents but we learn many of them from society at large right. and as long as we're not teaching children what real food is and what good food is they're going to grow up into the kind of adults that we are and we all know how difficult it is to make changes in our diet we all know not all but most of us know what it means to be addicted or habituated to sugar, to junk food, mm -hmm. to, and, and so it's really hard to make those changes. If 60% if of the food, 80% of the food in a supermarket is junk food or close to it, someone's gonna be eating that stuff. Right. It may not be you personally, but it's your neighbor, it's somebody. Right. So what do you do? What's the solution for it then? There are small solutions and there are big solutions. Right. Um, we have, to, we have to support the kind of agriculture that supports the land and that supports real farming. Mm -hmm. um, we can make those decisions on a national policy level, but we're not anywhere near doing that mm -hmm. right now. But we can support programs that move things in that direction and we can support farmers markets and CSAs and so forth. We can support the use of food stamps for those kind of programs so that yes. everybody has the opportunity to be buying better food. 
we can support programs that try to put land into the hands of farmers who really want to farm sustainably because one of the problems now is that there are many people who would like to farm but land is all owned and unaffordable and so much has been developed or so much is in the hand of big landowners um, how do we do that and again some of this is policy and i think a lot of it is we're playing a long game here this is not going to get better tomorrow mm -hmm. but it's important to talk about these things and to think about these things and make the kind of small changes we can make on a local level on a state level mm -hmm. and hope for changes on a federal level so on a micro level, though, as a parent, as individuals, we, we can start by, just like you said, supporting your CSA, supporting your farmer's market, buying those sustainably grown foods when possible. So All of that is true. I just think that it's, it's and, I'm, and I act that way also, mm -hmm. um, but the bigger picture is important. The fact, the fact that supermarkets need to change and farms need to change, and that isn't going to happen by us buying farm food at farmers markets or CSAs or whatever. It's only going to happen by supporting small farmers in bigger ways, by getting more people onto small farms, by restoring the dignity to farming, by supporting medium-sized farms, maybe 500 acre farms, 200 acre farms, that can make a serious contribution to local food supplies. It's not just uh, three and five and 10 acre farms, but right. bigger farms who can really supply supermarkets with cases and cases of vegetables with true volume yeah you're allowed to go into the grocery store and you're allowed to banish three items from the shelf anything you choose and they will never appear in the grocery store again what are they well soda sweet breakfast cereal yep i'd be happy with those too frankly <laughs> i know i know it was eye opening how much it how much really make a big difference i'm not you know, I wouldn't say candy. I mean, I'm, I might say <laughs> perhaps we and could have candy limited to a small part of the store instead yes. of everywhere. Everywhere. You know, you know, it's, well, it's past Easter, but you know, whenever there's a holiday, that holiday's candy starts showing up in the produce section. It's just everywhere, right? Months ahead of time. Months ahead of time. It's like August and the Halloween candy's up. So yes, it's ridiculous. <laughs> But I mean, if we, you know, soda is, um, people have been, have been railing against breakfast cereal, sweet breakfast cereal mm -hmm. since the 60s. I mean, since I was young. <laughs> soda is a very, very, is low hanging fruit. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a weak link in the chain um, because everybody thinks, yeah, this stuff is not good for us. We know that now. And there you go, you're drinking your, 32 ounce mega big gulp. <laughs> this is my water, watch it. <laughs> or maybe it's not water, but that's why it's opaque, no. Um, but you know, anything that we can do to decrease people's consumption of soda leads to better health results. Yeah. If you drink less soda, you drink more water, you are going to be, maybe not as an individual, but as a society, healthier. And that's right. been demonstrated. So we have half a dozen or maybe even 10 at this point, municipalities uh, in the US that have soda taxes. And in each one, soda consumption has gone down. So mm -hmm. Philly is the biggest, Philadelphia is the biggest, Berkeley was the first, Oakland, San Francisco, there are a few others. Um, there are whole countries that have soda taxes. Mexico mm -hmm. has a soda tax, Chile has a soda tax. Decreasing the consumption of soda benefits public health. Once, if we do that and we see that changes we make on a policy level can actually improve people's health outcomes, then we'll be encouraged to do more things To like do more. That. But to start small, and that's not even small. Even on an individual level, reducing one, uh, one beverage of, of soda a day has an impact on your health and weight and inflammation and everything. So I agree with you on that. Now, you mentioned changing your taste buds earlier. I know you advocate for the uh, VB6. Tell everybody about what VB6 is. It's one of your New York Times bestsellers. Um, tell everybody about that. It came about, I would say, 12 or 15 years ago. Okay. Um, 
I recognized for myself, I recognized that increasing the amount of unprocessed plants in my diet and decreasing everything else was a way that I was going to stay healthier longer. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is true for almost everyone. And I wasn't doing it. It's like if you say, it goes back to the availability question. If you say, I'm going to eat better, we all know how hard that is. Because then you drive by McDonald's or you're in the supermarket right. in the candy aisle or you have a weakness for potato chips and you go get gas or right. your favorite ice yes. cream parlor, whatever. Despite your best intentions, yes. Your, so I said, I need rules. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I set up this rule for myself, um, which was I'm going to eat like a crazy fanatic vegan until six o'clock at night every day. And then I'm going to do whatever I want to do after that. So now I would call it something like, I mean, it's a flexitarian diet, but I would call it something like two thirds vegan because that's okay. what I was. Mm -hmm. I would have no white food. I would have no processed food. I'd have no sugar. I would have no dairy. I'd have no meat, no animal products at all. All of that stuff was banned from the time I woke up until dinner. Mm -hmm. And at dinner, I drank wine, I ate meat, I did whatever I wanted. Okay. And it worked. I lost, I literally in six months lost 35 pounds. Wow. Is, I mean, I was, I weighed 15 or 20 pounds more than I weigh now. So mm -hmm. over the years, I've gained some of it back. But, um, but I was overweight. My cholesterol was too high. My blood pressure was getting up there. My blood sugar and so on. And all those numbers went in the right direction, which is down. Um, and I also, I felt great. So that is, it, people can do whatever they want, but we all know that for most Americans, the key to better individual health is eating more plants and eating fewer mm -hmm. animal products and less junk food. How do you do that? I don't care. But VB6 was a strategy, is a strategy that works for me and has worked for many other people. I like what you just said about rules because one thing I wanted to ask you is, okay, how do you go from not being a vegan to suddenly being having this vegan type diet? And I like what you just said, it was before six. Like I have my own rules. On the weeknights, I stop eating it at 9 p.m. Uh, I think having those rules, so it's not just, these are my best intentions, but I actually have norms in writing them down. It's either yeah. you can do everything at once. Some people respond to a, I'm becoming a vegan thing right. very well. Some respond to vegan before six kind of thing. Right. Some say, well, I'm not eating junk food Monday through Friday. Right. Whatever I, it is. I think that's a key concept is giving yourself some framework. And I know for me, giving yourself a little bit of an out. So those, you know, two nights a week, maybe you can have that, that junk food. Um, whatever it is, before six, weeknights. So anybody listening, if you want to make a change, make some norms. I write mine down. I remind myself, no junk food. If I start to lapse, you know, what, what's your norm? And, and start small, even if it's just two days a week that you're not having the processed foods, that's fine. So start with that, have that norm. That way you have something to follow, not something nebulous of a goal that can always be started tomorrow. I would say the most interesting thing for me right now is that um, there, does, there does seem to be more time. So I'm, I'm cooking maybe some more elaborate lunches than I normally do, but dinner... I have this firm belief that that any meal is good if you cook one good thing, one really good thing, and then you make a salad and maybe have some bread or some rice or whatever, but you do one thing that's impressive and delicious and, and you have fun eating that meal. And you don't need to make an elaborate meal with three great things or five great things. Make one thing that's really good. So say you, you, know, you have a busy night tonight. Tell, give us a couple of a quick, easy dinner shortcuts. I think the thing to do is to have some good sauces around, very simple sauces, pesto or even vinaigrette. Um, just very simple things that'll enliven anything that you make. And then you could broil or grill a piece of fish or some chicken, um, or you can just toss some things in a pan and cook them together and you'll have something that'll brighten them up a little bit. I mean, I think for general rules, I think that's right. I, you know, I think one of your questions when we were corresponding before, I know was three recipes that are, that are really important. And I think 
the sort of basic, really basic stuff. There are just three or four things that everybody should know how to do. And one is to broil or grill something and put a sauce on. And, the, you know, I could be more specific, but it's easier to look at recipes than to talk about them. Another is, what's a stir fry? Can I, can I cook some rice and then stir fry some vegetables or vegetables and tofu or vegetables and meat? Make a, build a little sauce in that pan, put it on the rice, call that dinner. Yeah. One is, and then a third is chopped salad. Can I take everything I have in the refrigerator, chop it up, put it in a bowl, throw some oil and vinegar on it and call that dinner? You can. Um, and my partner eats that for lunch almost every day. And that's, that's really a very valuable, just to have the confidence and to know the sh what to buy when you're in the store so that that can happen. And I'm, I agree with you on that salad. I always keep canned chickpeas and hearts of palm and beets, and I throw them onto a salad. And I tell people, don't, whatever the veggies look good, just, just throw them on. People always say, you have a beautiful salad. And I say, well, just throw everything on there. It doesn't matter. You don't be precious about your salad. I like to do burgers that are sort of 50% meat, 50% something else at this point. And that something else might be an old fashioned kind of breadcrumbs, parsley, onions, kind of mix, or it might be something a little more unusual, uh, like lentils and cumin and paprika and garlic, and but just to sort of change the texture of the burger, you can keep it really juicy, but you have a, you feel a little more self-righteous eating it, shall we say. <laughs> and you're probably full for a little bit longer because you're getting additional fiber with that as well. I cook grains and beans in huge batches once or twice a week and I keep them in the refrigerator and I use them. I just pull them out. So every day I'm pulling stuff out of the refrigerator. And then other stuff I just start chopping and cooking at the same time. So if something wants to be fresh, then I do it last second. Mm -hmm. If something can be cooked ahead, I try to cook it ahead. We haven't talked about whole grains much, but we want to be eating whole grains, but they take a while to cook. So there's two things you can do. You can cook them in advance, and then you don't really care how long they, I was going to say you can cook them while you're watching a ball game, but of course you can't watch yeah. a ball game. But, um, you can watch a replay of a ball game. I hear there's a lot of those. Bacon, but you can cook, cook grains ahead of time or cook them in a pressure cooker, but you should always cook grains in more amounts than you need because mm -hmm. they'll keep in the fridge for a week or more same with you so that's that's one thing and the other thing is to just anything that takes a while to cook i cook a lot of and anything that doesn't take a long time to cook i just cook it the last minute and that's i do the same I really almost never spend more than half an hour a in the kitchen so See, that's huge. I think that's really valuable. So it, it's prepping, I think prepping ahead of time is a huge lifesaver. And I think also you mentioned simple, you know, you roast, roast the fish, roast the chicken, quick stir fry, and then, you know, add a great sauce and it, it makes all the difference. All you can do is lead by example. Show them that you're cooking good food. Show them that you're cooking real food. Put real food on the table. You know, you can't be a complete dictator and say you can't leave the table until you finish your vegetables. You can just make good food available all the time. And you can say, yeah, you, you know, the whole thing of, yeah, you can have your Fruit Loops Saturday morning if you eat mm -hmm. a real breakfast all week or whatever it is. But whatever compromises you have to make, because you're not living in an ideal world. In an ideal world, you wouldn't be struggling with your child around stuff you'd be putting good food on the table and your child would be eating it but there's so much pressure on kids so much influence on kids to right. be demanding the wrong kinds of food it's just it's a tough situation all you can do is as i said lead by example make good food eat good food let your mm -hmm. kids see you eat good food yes you know let them see you eat it. My husband didn't like broccoli, so we had to work on his poker face when he eats the broccoli that I cook. Mark, where, tell people again where they can find you. Of course, find out more information about your book, which this just came out. I mean, talk about, you released a book during a pandemic, by the way. Just before, but yeah. Yes. How to eat. <laughs> That's great timing. Um, and of course. I mean, I would love it if people went to markbitman.com and signed up for 
our newsletter, which is twice weekly. Great recipes that you can cook any night. That pretzel recipe was in the newsletter. Mm -hmm. um, I subscribe to it. Books are on the website too. So the easiest one-stop shopping, markpittman.com.